Hello beautiful people, my name is Amanda Zero. If you are new here, I make motorcycle travel vlogs, how-tos, and general encouragement for you to get out and do the thing. This week is part two in my how to set up a versatile motorcycle camp kitchen that works for you. If you did not watch last week's video, AKA part one, I will link that above my head and down in the description. It is full of a lot of information and other kinds of tools and equipment that you may wanna think about, including in your camp kitchen setup, depending on your own needs. Today, we're gonna to be talking about organizing your food, the 101 of foil pack meals, cooler tips, and important food safety information that you need to keep in mind when you're making food at camp. Let's jump right into organizing your food. I carry spices and the majority of my cooking gear in one stuff sack, and then I carry the rest of my food and things that may explode in another stuff sack. <laughs> I know there are people who use packing cubes for this. It's the same idea. If you have hard panniers, you could also think about carrying a small plastic storage bin as your food sack, and that could also double as a kitchen sink at camp to make cleanup just a little bit easier. If you go on shorter excursions, like just a weekend trip or an overnighter, planning out your menu ahead of time of what you wanna eat and thinking about things that you can use the leftovers of to make the next meal means that you have exactly what you need to make the food that you wanna make, and there will be less food waste and less leftovers to deal with. Try and keep it as simple as possible and be realistic about how much time you want to spend making food at camp. When you're planning out your meals, make sure that you eat all of your perishable food first and leave any of the meals that use a lot of canned foods for the later half of your trip. For weekend trips, you have a lot more room to pre-prep your ingredients at home so you can create fancier meals at camp because all you have to do is dump it in the pot and cook it. Things like pre-prepping vegetables, cutting your meats, so all you have to do is slide it into the pan. Don't even have to worry about sanitizing that cutting board because all you did was slide it from the Ziploc to the pan. Keep in mind if you're doing a longer mileage kind of trip, there are going to be grocery stores. People have to get food pretty much everywhere. Even if you're doing a BDR style trip, there are dedicated checkpoints along your route that have towns that have grocery stores in them. So you don't really need to carry more than three days worth of food. You don't have to carry 10 days worth of food. <laughs> I personally pack about two days worth of food and then I stop at a grocery store and I stock up again. This also means that I don't have to dedicate quite as much space just to food in my saddlebags. It also means that I can eat fresher food for the length of my trip. And at some point on your trip, you're gonna look at the food that you have in your bags and you're gonna look at the restaurant in town and you're gonna opt for the restaurant in town. <laughs> Let's talk for a second about coolers. If you choose to take a cooler along with you, know the pros and cons and the limitations of a hard-sided cooler versus soft-sided coolers and plan accordingly. <laughs> soft-sided coolers aren't gonna be able to stay as cold for as long as a hard-sided cooler, especially when exposed to the sun for all of those long hours in the saddle before you get to camp. Speaking of sun, do your best to keep whatever cooler you choose to take in the shade when you get to camp, whether that's the shade off of your bike or better yet, the shade off of a tree or a bush. If you're traveling with a bunch of other people, split up the load. Take two coolers, one for food storage and one for drinks. Maybe even a small third cooler just for ice to refill the others if you're gonna be sticking around in one spot for more than a day. Before you even leave the house, starting with a cold cooler is gonna help keep everything else cooler as well. These reusable ice packs are great to put in a cooler to pre-chill it before you pack all your food for the trip. Or if you have a soft-sided cooler like this or this, you could put these in the freezer before you pack everything for your trip to make sure that it's as cold as it can possibly get at the get-go. I prefer using the reusable ice packs personally, but if you're gonna be gone for more than a day, they're not gonna do much good on the second day. So if you do have to go in and get ice to refill the fueler, try to keep that ice in its own Ziploc bag so that you're not waterlogging all of your food in the cooler as the ice melts. If you're gonna choose to take a cooler, go all in. You want it filled to its max capacity because any empty space in a cooler is just an invitation for warm air. If you're going for a weekend long trip, you can freeze any food that you're gonna eat in the next day or the day after and keep that in the bottom of the cooler because that's gonna act as an extra ice pack to keep everything else cooler. How many times can I say cooler? Uh. <laughs> when you're packing the cooler, think in layers. The last thing that you're gonna eat should be on the bottom and the first thing that you're gonna eat should be at the top. So layer of food, layer of ice or ice pack or something, and then a layer of food and ice and so on. 
Coolers are super useful for like weekend trips, but trying to keep a cooler cold when you're going to be gone for longer than a week is just a lot of extra work. I would rather stop at a grocery store every day to get food than try to keep a cooler cold for a week long trip. <laughs> Which is where my like weird no name roll top semi insulated bag comes in handy. It's not really a cooler, but it's just insulated enough that if I put yogurt in it, I know it's going to be safe for me to eat the next day. <laughs> Unless it's really hot outside. <laughs> All right, moving on to foil pack 101. I know a few of you were excited about this. Before I get on to the example of how to fold a foil pack, a couple of tips first. Use heavy duty aluminum foil and double it up once you've wrapped it all together. Use a little bit more oil than you think that you need because that's what's going to keep your food from sticking to the foil. If you have a grill, opt for the grill over coals. If there is no grill, then opt for the nice red coals to cook your food. Coals are where all of the good food cooking heat comes from, not flames. Rotate your food for even cooking. That way one side doesn't get burnt while the other side is practically raw. If you plan on cooking foil meals with coals, think about taking some metal tongs. I guess you could jerry rig a pair of tire spoons as some tongs in a pinch. I don't really recommend trying to use your motorcycle gloves to fish your tin foil meals out of coals. You might damage your gloves a lot. <laughs> the, the tin foil is going to be pretty darn hot, so be aware of that. One of the great things about making a foil pack meal instead of like grilling your food is that it creates a lot of steam. So it's a great way to steam vegetables. It's a really great way to bake potatoes. But the key to that steam is getting a good seal on your foil pack. You're going to start with a large sheet of foil, at least 14 to 16 inches long. And you're going to place your food in the center of that foil with a goodly amount of oil. You're going to bring the longer sides up and fold the edges over to secure the packet, leaving a pocket of space to form a kind of tent over your food. Then you're gonna roll the shorter sides up to seal the packet, again, leaving space inside for heat and steam to circulate. The other cool thing about foil pack meals is that you can practice doing this at home. You prepare all of your ingredients and you roll up your foil packet like you would at camp, and then you put it in your oven at 450 degrees and then you cook it for the same amount of time that whatever foil pack recipe you're following tells you to cook it for. So that's, that's a good way to perfect your foil wrapping skills. <laughs> All right, let's go over some food safety basics. Number one, always wash your hands before you prepare food that's gonna go in your body. If you don't have water, use alcohol, use hand sanitizer, use antibacterial wet wipes. If you have to use wet wipes, try to use wet wipes that aren't scented. <laughs> Number two, if you are in the backcountry or if you're in another country and you didn't get your water from a trusted potable source, boil it, filter it, or treat it before you use it to cook food. Number three, wash vegetables and fruit with clean water. Number four, clean your utensils, your bowls, your cups, your cutting boards and knives with clean water and soap and let it dry completely before you use it again. It's also a super great idea to wash those things again when you get home before you store them. Number five, if you're preparing raw meat, do not chop vegetables on the same cutting board you just used to chop meat on. If you only have one cutting board, chop your vegetables up first and then prepare your meat and then make sure that you do a very thorough job of sanitizing that cutting board afterwards. Number six, cook your food well and keep it covered so that flies aren't landing on it and eat it while it's hot. If you're preparing raw meat, make sure that you're cooking it to the correct internal temperature, especially chicken. Number seven, if you're gonna take a cooler, you need to keep that cooler below 40 degrees. The danger range for food is between 40 degrees Fahrenheit and 140 degrees Fahrenheit. If you're worried at all that your food was stored in the danger range of temperature for more than two hours, make sure that you heat it to boiling before you eat it. Side note, this is kind of why I don't take leftovers when I eat at restaurants, even if I can't finish all of it when I'm on the road. Number eight, if you are taking raw meat with you, double bag it, keep it in a separate cooler if you can. If not, keep it at the bottom of the cooler. So in the case that it does leak, it's not leaking, it's raw juices all over everything else in the cooler. Number nine, do not use a dirty bandana or a dirty towel to dry your hands or your dishes after you've done washing them. 
any towels or microfibers or anything like that that you use in the food prepping process should be included in your laundry load while you're on your trip. While we're talking about food safety involved with prepping your food, let's also talk about food storage and leave no trace because that's also going to affect your overall safety while you're camping. <laughs> you're going to want to store your food and dishes away after every single use and keep it free from food bits. This will protect your food and you from wild animals, especially rodents, which are the most common visitor while you're camping. Try to avoid cooking too close to your tent. One, because if you're using a campfire to cook, the embers can pop up and put holes in your nylon, but also the food smells from you cooking will transfer to your tent and animals will still think that there is food in it. <laughs> Along those lines, it's a good idea not to store your food in your tent. Especially if you're in bear country, do not store food or anything with a scent like deodorants, toothpastes, scented wet wipes, that kind of stuff all needs to go into a bear bag that needs to be hung or put in a bear safe container away from wherever you're sleeping. If wherever you're camping is not a bear active area, you still don't want to store your food inside of your tent because the rodents will chew through the nylon of your tent to get to food. And it's a lot easier to replace a small nylon sack that you're keeping your food in than it is to replace a hundred, three hundred, four hundred dollar tent. Dispose of your wastewater from cleaning up 100 feet away from any water source. And please do not do your dishes in any creeks, streams, ponds, rivers, or lakes. You can collect some water from that, move away from the water source, and do your dishes. <laughs> yes, even if you're using biodegradable soap, it's still not a good idea. Treat any of your garbage the same way that you would your food. Pack it up, seal it up, and keep it safe while you're at camp and then pack it out. Try your darndest to only pack and prepare food you know you're going to eat. That way you don't have to worry about what to do with the leftovers. Anything you do have left over, meat, vegetables, should still be sealed up and packed out and treated just as carefully as the rest of your food. I cannot emphasize how important it is to leave no trace, whether you're camping at a designated campground, you're dispersed camping in national forest, or you're boondocking on BLM. It is so, so important to clean up after yourself and leave no trace to protect you, to protect the people who are going to camp there after you, and to protect the animals in that place, and to make sure that the areas that we can camp stay open. With that serious note out of the way, <laughs> now we get to my favorite part of preparing for making meals at camp, the inspiration part and finding recipes you want to try out. One of my favorite resources is the new camp cookbook. It is chock full of a ton of really great information and recipes, but information wise, this is like gold. It also has a chart for safe storage times for chilled foods. Seriously, love this book, whether you get a physical copy or a Kindle copy, one of my favorites. I also wanna recommend Dirty Dining by Lisa Thomas of To Ride the World. This one is chock full of great recipes and awesome stories of their time traveling the world on motorcycles. And it's also just awesome to support other members of the Marcella community. There's of course a ton of resources online that are free. One of my favorites is Fresh Off The Grid. They have a ton of recipes on their website for car camping, backpacking. I can normally adapt some of their car camping recipes for my needs. They also have a nice little slider on their website so you can adjust the amount of servings and it'll automatically adjust the ingredients. And I love that. That's like one of my favorite things. <laughs> all right, you guys, I hope that you enjoyed this video and got something out of it. I will have a list of all my favorite camp kitchen equipment down in the description with links. Question for my end screen crew. <laughs> Let me know your favorite resource to find new camping recipes to try out. All right, you guys, I'll see you later.